me start off by uh, reminding us that um, your first four assignments are due by tonight on Teams. So I'll send a reminder this afternoon as well. Uh, I'm looking for both your notes and your homework worksheets to be turned in per assignment. So assignment one, you have two pages of notes, two pages of, um, of uh, homework or, or practice problems. So each assignment is going to be four pages. OK, so assignments one and two are grouped together and assignments three and four are grouped together. So you assign, you'll be um, turning them in um, separately through teams. Um, there's a late grade of 10%, so even if you turn everything in late, um, you can still get a, a 90, so not a huge penalty, but hopefully um, enough for most of us to to want to take advantage of um, getting that full credit. So, oops. If you have any questions about uh, anything, just feel free to reach out to me through email or through uh, text remind. OK. Also, I'll be um, um, hopefully putting out the chapter seven recovery assignment today um, uh, so that you guys can start looking at it. And then for those of you who are wanting to do recovery, I can hopefully I can return your at least comments uh, for your test so that you can you know what to do corrections on and and, um, and I'll have a help session Friday um, 7 30 and 3 30 um, for um, uh, if you want to do that recovery or if you want help session um, uh, over that chapter 7 test So today we're going to be talking about uh, this very specific type of uh, free response question. This is a very common um, free response topic on the AP exam, and this is uh, called antiderivative word problems. So word problems involving antiderivatives. OK, so. Let's go to our handout here. Uh, I'm going to I put some notes up here uh, before uh, number one, so just want to spend some time talking about how units of measure is impacted each time you take the derivative or each time you take the integral. So for instance, let's say you have something that is um, that we all kind of can visualize or that we understand uh, with particle motion or with um, with position velocity acceleration, right? We know that each time um, we go from one uh, quantity to another, we know our units will change. Right? We know that um, position is in terms of maybe meters, then velocity is going to be meters per second, right? And the reason why is because each time um, we add a rate, we're including another time unit in the denominator. So because velocity is change in position over change in time, that's why we have meters per second. And the derivative process, the slow process, the rate of change process is allowing that to occur. So if I want to find the derivative of velocity, then it's going to turn into meters per second squared because we're applying a derivative, which is a rate of change. And when you do the rate of change, there's slope involved. So for instance, if I have change in velocity over change in time, six minus two is four. You have four meters per second per second. And so what happens is your meters per second is adding on another time component. So it's meters per second squared. OK, so we know that if there's derivative, whenever there's slope, your units of measure will just naturally change. Same thing, though, when you do the integral process, when you do the antiderivative process. So for instance, if I'm sitting at velocity being meters per second, then the integral of velocity is going to change that new unit of measure to be in terms of meters. And that's going to be the accumulation of rates because we're finding the area under the graph through integration. That will result in a new unit of measure giving us displacement. So when you take the integral, your denominator um, unit is going to be stripped away. So your time unit is going to be removed each time uh, we go through the integral. Okay. 
Now, I want to talk about something that uh, is more concrete, then we can move on to this integral uh, notation. Something that's more concrete is the fact that, let's say um, you're traveling along a straight road, 60 miles per hour over a five hour period, right? What have you accomplished over that five hour period? Well, you know that 60 miles per hour over a five hour period means that you're just gonna multiply, right? And when we think, when we do multiplication, we're gonna kind of do something that is kind of area related, right? So travel 60 miles per hour over a five hour period, that's 60 times five, which is 300. But you all know that your units of measure will change, right? 60 miles per hour over a five hour period, you would never say that's 200 miles per hour. You instantly know that the hours just dropped away and you just left with miles. So same idea here, when you take the integral, you're essentially doing this. You're taking a rate over a time period. So imagine the integral expression 60 being the rate and you're multiplying over that five hour period and you're left with 300. So if I went through power rule, I will get the same result. 60 becomes 60 T using power rule. Plug in upper and lower bound. Five goes in for T, we get 60 times five. Zero goes in for T, we get 60 times zero. So 300 minus zero is 300. So 300 miles. Okay. So we're going to be accumulating a rate over a time period. And that's why we're going to keep relying on intervals to handle rates that are not as clean as just a constant rate. OK, so we're going to take that concept and apply it into number one. OK, so here's number one. It says the rate at which people enter an amusement park is given by this E of T. Okay. The rate at which people leave the same amusement park on the same day is modeled by the function L of T. Okay. The problem says that E of T and L of T are measured in people per hour. That's something to keep in mind. And time T is measured in hours. Time T is measured in hours after midnight. These functions are valid between 9 and 23. So between 9 a.m. and 11 p.m. are the hours during which the park is open. At time T equals 9, there are no people in the park. Part A, how many people have entered in the park by 5 p.m.? OK. Now we have a rather complex E of T and L of T. Let me start off with something that's easier that we can kind of grasp, and then we can take that concept and apply it to um, our specific problem. So let's let me just do a demonstration here. Let's do an easier example. Right. So let's say that um, E of T is an easy number, like 100 people per hour. Now, this is probably a little better um, demonstration in terms of what's happening because every hour there's probably going to be a different number amount of people entering into the park, right? Because um, you expect less in the morning and the more in the afternoon and less in the evening. But let's just say it's just a constant 100 people per hour entering into the park. Okay. So what's going to happen after five hours? Different people, right? Because you multiply, right? You multiply, that's area related, and we're going to be involving integrals with this. But right now we can do this by hand. We don't need to go through integral process. So essentially, this is what's happening, right? If you take the integral, you're changing the units. People per hour turns into number of people. So likewise, if I take the integral of E of T, over the course of zero to five. This is accomplishing the same thing as this, but this, we didn't we didn't have to go through a calculus procedure, but this is what the calculus procedure would look like. We'll end up with 500 people. Okay, we're involving the integral to help us achieve the accumulation of our rate. We're accumulating rate over a period of time. That's what the integral is doing here. 
same process. So I don't want us to get bogged down with, wait, what does this mean? It just means that I'm going to be multiplying that rate by the number, by the, um, the the amount of time that passes, and that's going to achieve me um, the units that's going to change as well. The time period is going to be stripped away, and it's just going to be whatever that, that numerator unit is. OK, so let's apply that concept into this problem. But now our E of T is not going to be a constant. It's just going to be some expression, but it's going to be applied the same way. So part A says, how many people have entered the park by 5 p.m.? Round your answer to the nearest whole number. So we have a formula that tells us people per hour. So what do you think we have to do to find the number of people? Yep, the integral that with that equation, right? We're going to accumulate this rate, which is right now sitting in terms of people per hour. And we're going to accumulate that rate over a specific time period. And what's that time period going to be? Um, okay. But what's our lower bound from? Well, um, zero in the sense that you're thinking in terms of the beginning of the day, right? But in this case, the beginning of the day is going to be 9 a.m. Yeah, but the, the your, your idea is right. So 9 to 17, that will take care of when the park opens and um, 17 is 5 p.m. OK, so we go to our calculator. You can definitely use 36 Pro or 84. I like to, um, because these are rather uh, large uh, expressions, I'm going to let Y1 hold um, my E of X. But if you're using 36 Pro, you can enter everything into the same line. Just use that uh, integral notation definite integrals to get to that answer. So I'm using Y1, so I have Y1 holding E of T. I'm going to go back to my home screen. Math 9. From 9 to 17. Of our function. Vars, Y vars function. I have Y1 holding and then dx. We have a rate of, uh, of uh, EFT. We accumulate that rate over an eight hour period, and then our people per hour is going to turn into people. So that's what we've gathered. 6,004 people have entered into the park between 9 and 5 p.m. Anybody have any issues with their calculator? It's good to practice whichever calculator you're using. Okay. Part B. The price of admission for the park is $15 until 5 p.m. After 5 p.m., the price of admission to the park is $11. How much is collected from admissions to the park on that given day? Round your answer to the nearest whole number. So this would be an easier problem if it was just $15 flat rate the entire day. Then we can just do 15 times 6,004 and then we have our answer. But the fact that there is a split rate. How would you adjust for it? Make two integrals. Okay. Make two integrals. OK, and then each integral multiplied by. The amount that we charge, right? OK, so. I have 15. I'm going to do the um, the 9 to 5 p.m. first. So $15 is going to be charged for those who've entered in the park between 9 and 17. 
what's the second expression? Well, what's going to come after that? Plus what? Um, integral from 17 to um, mm -hmm. 23. Yeah. And we'll multiply this number of people by 11. So this will give us how much is brought in for those um, coming in during the main, um, during the morning, during the day. And then this is how much is brought in after 5 p.m. And we'll add those together and that will give us the revenue brought in by ticket sales. Okay, so practice entering into your calculator. Any questions? Any questions with the concept? Okay, part C. I'll put this on a separate sheet so I have more room to work this out. Okay, let me read this problem here. It says, let h of t be the integral from 9 to t of v of x minus l of x for that time period when the park is open between 9 and 23. The value of h of 17 to the nearest whole number is 3725. Find the value of h prime of 17 and explain the meaning of h of 17 and h prime of 17 in the context of this amusement park. All right. Uh, we know what h of 17 is, so let me just make that adjustment and then I want to kind of break this apart so we can kind of understand what this is telling us. Okay, so I'm just replacing T with 17 just to make it easier for us to have some more concrete example, but I'm going to break this into two separate parts. Okay, I'm going to say that this is there's an integral from 9 to 17 of E of X involved. And there's also the integral, oops, there's also the integral from 9 to 17 of L of X involved. So let's define each part and kind of talk about what they represent. What does the integral from 9 to 17 of E of X represent? Uh, people that entered from like time equal to 9 to 10 for 17. Yep, the number of people. And we know that this is not going to be a rate, right? We take the integral of it. We know that this is going to result in the number of people. Number of people entered the park. Between 9 to 5 p.m. Okay. What do you think the integral from 9 to 17 of L of X represents? The total number of people who've left the park, right? Okay, so number of people. So what do you think by subtracting it, what is that information going to give me? At any given moment, right? So if H of 17 is equal to 37.25, what does that number represent then? Okay, so 
Good. So if we accumulate all the people who've entered in the park, and if we counted the people who've left the park, then we'll, what's left is the number of people remaining in the park, right? So 3,725 people remaining in the park. At 5 PM. OK, so we take something that's very abstract and we turn it into something that that makes sense from a um, just from a reasoning standpoint. OK, any questions so far? Let me zoom out a little bit here. So now we're not done with part C yet. Part C is also saying find the value of H prime of 17 and explain the meaning of H of 17, which we already did. We already explained H of 17 and H prime of 17. But before we move on to H prime of 17, we first have to find H prime of T. Okay, we've got to have something, a derivative to work from before we can plug numbers in. So we're going to transition from H of T to H prime. Now, if I want to find the H, if I want to find H prime, what's going to happen to this expression? What's the derivative of this expression going to be? Good, right? So right now the integral is sitting at one level above E of X minus L of X, right? And the derivative is just going to make it, it's going to just drag that down to that E of X minus e of L of X level. So derivative is just going to undo that process we're just like we're taking an expression and we're either moving it up or down, right? And derivative and integrals allows us to move between um, regions. So exactly right. I'm just going to get the notation of what's happening. So d over dt. But essentially, we know that these operations is just going to kind of undo each other. So we know h prime. Ultimately, when the dust settles, we know these two will just undo each other. Now, there's something uh, notation-wise that's going on because of second theorem. This upper bound is going to replace, and so I'm going to have E of T minus L of T. Okay? The upper bound is going to end up replacing that variable there. Okay. Any questions from H of T to H prime of T. Everybody see that adjustment? Okay. So they say find H prime of 17, which we know must be E of 17 minus L of 17. Now it's if H of seven, if H of X or H of T is in terms of the number of people. What's H prime going to be in terms of? Good. This is people per hour. And that's exactly right, right? H prime is the rate at which the number of people in the park is changing. OK, I'll write that down. So before we enter anything in, let's just visualize if we can kind of just guess what is, is happening. What do you think is happening in terms of the rate at 5 p.m.? Oh, um, yeah, let's 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 not involve the, the ticket price. Uh, I think just in, in general, uh, regardless of, of ticket price, um, what do you expect on a general day? Um, for people entering the park on a normal day. Oh, yeah, so at 5 p.m., right, the rate at which people are entering is probably going to be less than those people that are leaving, right? There's on a, you know, assuming that it's not a special day where there's some event going on, typically we expect um, people to be leaving more than those are coming in at 5 p.m. So what do you expect this number to end up being? Negative, right? Probably negative. OK, so just want to kind of give some context, you know, so because we're dealing with all these abstract notations. I want to keep bringing it back to something that you can 
reason out and visualize and just kind of have a picture in your head. OK, so now we're going to find that value. E of 17 minus L of 17. I have um, E of T and L of T represented under Y1 and Y2 so that I don't have to keep um, typing the function in. So I'm just going to do Y of Y of 17 minus Y2 of 17 because I have it defined already. But if you're using uh, 36 Pro, you're going to have to enter it in um, manually. So I'm just going to vars, y vars, function, and then picking y1 and y2. And I have y1 uh, being defined for e of t, and I have y2 being defined for l of t. Okay. We expect a negative number, right? Because we expect more people to be leaving the park than entering. Uh, I got a negative number, but it's easier if I think in terms of a decimal. So if you do math, decimal, you can convert that fraction to a decimal. Okay, so negative 380. Okay, so exactly right. We can say that number of people in the park is decreasing by a rate of 380 people per hour at 5 p.m. OK, um, Okay. any questions with part C? OK, now part D, part D says, at what time does the model predict that the number of people is at a maximum? Now let's think in terms of a calculus uh, procedure here. Number of people at a maximum. So usually when we think about a maximum, it's a relative maximum. And what can you say about the maximum? There's a what? Relative max. Okay. What in, in terms of a, a calculus um, feature, what do you know about? Uh, say it again. What? Not x equals zero, something else equals slope phase. Yeah, slope is zero, right? So usually when we're looking for maximum or minimum, we're looking for where slope is zero. So that's how we're going to approach this problem. We're going to find when h prime is equal to zero. Okay, so I'll talk about it from a calculus perspective and then why it makes sense um, from uh, just a reasoning perspective. So I want to find out when. E of T minus L of T is equal to zero. So essentially, um, we're going to be graphing this and then looking for the x-intercept, or you can just plug this into numSolve and solve for the uh, solve for T this way. But let me just talk about uh, the, from a reasoning perspective why this makes sense. OK, so over the course of the day, OK, let's just think in terms of what's happening with E of T. So compare 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. What do you expect from E of T? Right, so but E of T in general, right? So E of T is going to be falling, right? If you compare 11 versus 2 versus 5 versus 7, it's probably generally going to be falling, right? So E of T is falling over the course of the day. How about L of T? What's L of T going to do over the course of the day? Increasing, right? 
there's not many people who's leaving the park at 11 a.m. But then come 4 p.m., there's more people. And then come 5 p.m., there's more people. So generally it's rising, right? So we're trying to find that place. And you can kind of imagine if EFT is decreasing and LFT is increasing, then it's going to come to a point where they're going to be matched evenly, right? And that is when the park is going to be at a maximum. Because as soon as we get past that point, once LFT gets above EFT, then the population inside the park is going to start shrinking, right? So that's why we're looking to see when EFT minus LFT is equal to zero, or in other words, when EFT is equal to LFT, right? Wherever EFT equals LFT, that is that point right before that maximum starts to decrease. Okay, so we're going to be, um, we can graph this. And then we can look for the X intercept here. That's our solution. So in our calculator, I have E and E of T, E of X and L of X already uh, defined under Y1 and Y2. So I'm just going to say um, E of X minus L of X under Y3, just so that I don't have to keep typing in the same function. I can just call it. And something else is that if you're using graphing calculator, you may have all these graphs that are highlighted, but you only want to graph the function that you want to see. So I just want to see y1 minus y2, and I'm just going to graph it and look for the x-intercept. Okay, so I'm going to do zoom six just to see if it'll fit inside a 10 by 10 window. If it doesn't, I may have to expand it out. So. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, which means that my graph is probably outside of this region. So I'm going to do zoom out just so I can get some perspective. If you do zoom out, you got to hit enter twice. Hit enter again. That double line means that you're zooming out a little bit more. Now here's my x-intercept, but you see how vertical the line is? That means I'm zoomed in a little too far. If you look at E of X and L of X, look at how large these numbers are. So chances are we probably need to stretch out our Y value to be a lot larger than what's in our window. So you go to window. So right now my Y min, Y max is negative, but negative 40, 40, but these are all in the thousands. So what if I just try different numbers, much larger? Let's go from negative 500 to 500. See if that will help us get a little bit more curve into our graph so it'll be easier to follow the path. Okay, so that's a little better, right? I can see there's more curvature. I can kind of, I know I'll have an easier time uh, scrolling through the graph. So if I do second trace, zero, that will allow me to look for the x-intercept. So second zero, second trace zero, left bound. I'm going to see if it will take me to a place that I can see that is to the left of the x. Yep, yeah, right there. So I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to choose continue with my arrow, go to a point on the other side of the x axis, x intercept, hit enter again. And now t is equal to 15.794. So 15.794, that's between 3 and 4 p.m., and that kind of makes sense, right? Mid-afternoon is generally when we would expect a park to be at its, um, at its busiest. Okay, any questions with number one? Okay, let's do another one. Uh, let's do go to number three. Okay, let's go to number three. 
Okay, here's number three. A tide removes sand from Sandy Point Beach at a rate modeled by the function R given by R of T. A pumping station adds to the beach. So you got the tide removing sand from the beach. You got a pumping station that's adding sand to the beach at a rate modeled by the function S. Both R of T and S of T are in terms of units, cubic yards per hour. So that's something to make a note of. Measured uh, between zero and six hours at time t equals zero, the beach contains 2,500 cubic yards of sand. So part A, how much sand will the tide remove from the beach during the six hour period? Indicate units of measure. So just like how we did with number one, what can we do to find how much sand has accumulated that uh, has been removed over that time period? Yeah. Good. Take the integral of R of T. We can't just do R of T, right? If we do R of T, then it's stuck in, in uh, cubic yards per hour, which is not what we want. We want just cubic yards of sand. So we got to take that rate, move it up a level. So the way we do that is we involve integral, which essentially is multiplying that rate over a time period. So integral from when to when? Yep, zero to six. Okay, we're taking that rate, we're multiplying it over a six hour period. That's what this integral notation is doing for us. And we're going to achieve something from that's going to take us from cubic yards per hour up to just cubic yards. Okay. Using your calculator, either one works. I have it entered into 36 Pro here. Make sure you're in radian mode. And I got Okay, same concept as number one, right? And also you're going to see this pattern with uh, in, with uh, free response questions. They usually start off something that's more manageable or easier, and then they kind of they kind of build on it as you go from B to C to D. So um, that's usually um, how they how they design most free response questions. Okay, part B. Write an expression for y of t, which is the total number of cubic yards of sand on the beach at time t. So here's something that I want to talk about is for these problems, there is a this common thread of this, this formula that gets used over and over again. So I want to kind of talk about this formula and then we can just adapt it for this problem as well as for other problems as well. So here's a formula that I think will be useful for us is the total amount is equal to the initial amount plus the amount added minus the amount removed. And a quick example of this that we can have an easy time relating to is imagine you have asking about a, a total amount of, of money in your bank account. So however much money is in the bank account is however much money you started with, how much you've added to it, and how much you've removed from it. Right? If you take those three things into account, then you have the total amount of whatever you're, uh, you're asking to find. And we're going to apply this for this problem, for the amount of sand on the beach. So we'll say y of t. Now keep in mind, this is 
amount of sand, so everything should be in terms of cubic yards. All right, let's keep that in mind. OK, what's the initial amount? Say it again. 25. Good, right? The problem says 2,500 cubic yards of sand is at time t equals zero. OK. All right, what can we use to represent the amount of sand added to the beach? But right now, that 15t over 1 plus 3t is sitting as a unit of oh, yes, per hour. pounds per hour. So how do we get it into amount? Yeah. Integral, good. So we got to involve that integral. We got to say the integral of s of. Now, the issue right now is that right now we're creating a general equation, so we don't have a time uh, um, involved yet. So we want to give it a variable time because it could be a three hour period or four hour period or, or six hour period. We want to give it that flexibility that we can use the formula for any time value that we want. So we're going to leave it as from zero to T. But some adjustment we have to make here is we got to use a different variable here. So we got to say S of X, but the concept is, is the same, right? We're taking that you're involving integral because you want something to represent the amount of sand, not the amount per, not the uh, cubic yards per hour. So likewise, what can we do to represent the amount of sand removed? R of X. Yeah, integral, right? Integral from zero to T of R of X dx. So everything is in terms of cubic yards, which is good. We all have, uh, these are all matching units, so we know this will give us the total amount. Okay, so if I want to find the, the amount five hours in, I can just replace five in for T and then plug in the calculator. OK, that's going to come later. But right now, it's just asking for a formula. OK, questions? All right, part C. That's it for part B. Part C says, find the rate at which the total amount of sand on the beach is changing. We have the total amount, but it's asking for the rate of that total amount, the rate at which that total amount is changing. Good. So we got to we got to transform y to be y prime. Okay. Let's find y prime before we we worry about that t equals four. So we're literally just going to find the derivative of each expression, and this will be good practice for us too. All right. What's going to happen with twenty five hundred? Zero. Okay. That's good. What's the derivative of the integral of s of x? Just be s of x. Yeah, pretty much. But we got to plug that upper bound in for that x, so it'll be s of t. So essentially, you take the derivative of an integral, which is going to remove that integral, right? You're going to remove that integral, and you're just left with s of t. That's a little bit of a second theorem there. The upper bound does replace that the variable um, in the expression. Minus what? Um, Good, so we're taking the derivative, right? Constant goes to 0. Integral goes to just the expression. The integral goes to just the expression. So right now you're taking some of that sitting one level above s of x and r of x, and you're bringing it down to be in terms of s and r. OK, we have our formula. Now we can find y prime of 4, right? y prime of 4. So in the calculator, it goes S of 4 minus R of 4 manually um, in for T, or you can put it in there Y1 and Y2. I'm going to jump to the answer here, though. OK. Oh, and then does the unit make sense? All right, y of t is in terms of cubic yards, so y prime should be cubic yards per hour, right? We're introducing a rate back into the problem, so y prime should match um, the units that we have for R and S, which is cubic yards per hour. Now, what, is this, what does that number represent? Can you put into words what this means? The rate at which the amount of sand is changing on the beach. Okay, 
So, but that, what is that? What's that negative two or negative one point nine tell you? Decreasing, right? So even though uh, sand is being pumped in to the beach, looks like there's gonna um, the rate at which um, sand is being removed is higher. So even at the fourth hour, uh, the sand on the beach is decreasing, right? Okay. Okay. Maybe you don't have to write it all out in these words. In these words, just want to kind of make sure that we can consistently just keep in our heads, um, kind of get it out of the abstract so we can have some um, visual or some um, reasoning, understanding of, of what's going on besides looking at just all these bunch of, um, of notations. Okay, now part D. Between zero and six, at what time is the amount of sand on the beach at a minimum? So again, whenever we see max or minimum, we got to involve derivative, right? So if you think about a minimum, that's when slope is zero. zero. So we're going to approach it from that perspective. We want to know when y prime is equal to zero. So we want to know when s of t minus r of t is equal to zero. Go through a graphing perspective if you like. I have S of T and R of T um, under Y4 and Y5, so I'm just going to subtract Y4 minus Y5, and I'm just going to graph it. But you can use numSolve as well. You can um, do numSolve here and solve for T or solve for X. I'm going to do zoom six. See if hopefully that will fit into my graph. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Sometime between zero and six is what I'm looking for. So I'll do a second trace zero. I'll pick a point to the left of the X intercept, hit enter. Pick a point on the other side of the X intercept, hit enter. So T is equal to 5.117. But it's the problem is that this is not asking for the relative minimum. It's asking for the minimum value. So this the understood uh, word here in front is absolute minimum. So if I want to find the absolute minimum, that's a little bit of application of EVT of extreme value theorem. So I want to talk about that here, reviewing a little bit of a concept from before EVT. So if I want to find the absolute max or absolute min, I got to involve concepts of EVT, which means I got to test critical points and I got to test what? Yeah, the endpoints, right? So EVT, we have to test not only the relative min, but also the endpoints. So we got to test endpoints and critical point, which is what we found here. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the amount of sand at zero versus the amount of sand at five hours versus the amount of sand at six hours and look to see which one is the actual absolute minimum. And the nice thing is we have the formula created from part B, so we can just insert our different time values into Y of T. And we can compare how much sand there is on the beach at those particular time periods. Okay, so we'll find y of zero. We'll find y of 5.117. 
And then it says from zero to six, right? So that means six is our other endpoint. We'll find y of six. Y of zero is easy. If we plug zero in for all this, that will just naturally disappear for us. So just 2,500. Y of 5.117 though, we got to say 2,500 plus the integral from zero to 5.117 of S. So we have this amount of sand, we have this amount added, we have this amount removed, and then we make the calculator tell us how much sand there is remaining on the beach five hours into um, this time period. Okay, six hours in, 2,500, plus the amount added from zero to six. So the rest is all calculator work. I'm going to jump to the end here. Twenty five hundred versus twenty four ninety two versus twenty four ninety three. So the absolute minimum is at five hours. So we brought in Extreme Valley Theorem. So you can see how much is involved with this problem, right? Um, but they're all concepts that we've seen, but we just need practice seeing how all of these can be can be brought together under one, you know, under one problem. Good. So we got through these two problems, which is what I wanted to do. Uh, we may be able to do some more in the next day, but maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll go back to focusing on more of the uh, uh, the standard integral uh, integral rules. Um, but I think it's good if we um, try to hit one of these um, in a, you know, over the next coming days. Maybe I'll spend part of Friday. I know it's a uh, it's asynchronous day, but maybe I'll do some recordings in terms of um, going through problems for students who want to see it. So. All right, thanks everyone. I uh, hope you guys have a great day. Uh, I'll send out a reminder again uh, this afternoon, but hopefully you guys can all get in your assignments one through four by tonight, okay? All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day.